I guess I'm wrapping it up. Nandita Basu is not here uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I hope you will all stay warm. It's a little chilly in here, but I'm going to talk about data-driven estimates of regional nitrate transport and reactions using a vertical flux model. So I have to warn you, there are a few equations, but I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, this is work with the National Water Quality Assessment Program and with the U.S. Geological Survey. So the uh, overarching goal here is uh, working towards making regional flux estimates. So not so much as in some previous talks, sort of synthesizing large data sets um, in terms of uh, spatial variability, or, and not so much in terms of intensive small-scale studies, but more sort of a middle ground of having some mechanistic understanding of what's happening at a regional scale. Uh, NACWA has been collecting, of course, as you've heard, these uh, large data sets across the country. Uh, and this map on the upper right shows locations where there's nitrate above the MCL. Um, and the challenge is how can we quickly synthesize this data, which is collected locally around well screens, how can we synthesize that sort of data in a regional context to come up with estimates of nitrate transport and reactions? And I believe that figure on the lower left is from you. I didn't know that until I stole it. Yeah, so the basic principle of this vertical flux model um, is essentially to map application histories to observed groundwater concentration profiles. So on the top left here is an example of some mass application, we'll say nitrate in this case. Uh, and you can have inputs that are estimated from fertilizer records or from manure inputs, or it can be calibrated, and I'll get to that later. But essentially you have some concentrations over time, and the crux of this method is just to transpose that to a vertical profile of concentrations with depth. And there's some simple mathematics involved. Um, and another very important aspect of this method is that it deals with particular types of data. We're dealing with data sets that include age tracers so that we can relate the vertical profiles and the depths to travel times as well as nitrate, and uh, it's, it's important in many cases to have dissolved gas analyses so we can estimate uh, nitrogen gas from denitrification uh, and dissolved O2, which is important for denitrification reactions. So this is a little more detail about the model. Um, we have uh, sort of a sim simplified conceptual uh, schematic of what we're using around the vicinity of each well. So we're assuming homogeneous uniform properties around each well. Um, you have some mass inputs at the ground surface that can come from sources such as irrigation, atmospheric sources, fertilizer, manure, and you have water, nitrogen, age tracers, and whatever other tracers you want to include coming in through those sources. Um, there is a sort of a generic loss term in the unsaturated zone in soil, which we call a leaching fraction. So, for example, for nitrate, we typically see leaching fractions of somewhere between 0 0.05 to 0 0.6 of the original source mass reaching the water table. Um, and then the important detail of this equation on the lower left is that this relates the travel time to the depth. That's all you really need to know. As, the, as a particle goes down to the water table and then moves down through the aquifer, the vertical velocity decreases exponentially with depth. And since we are, since we're assuming lateral homogeneity around the well, you can collapse this 2D problem into a 1D vertical profile. So to go a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of it, again, we're just transposing this uh, input history into a vertical profile. The concentrations are determined by the mass input, the leaching fraction, and the recharge along with some reaction term, in this case a zero order reaction term, which includes a lag time to account for oxygen inhibition of denitrification. Uh, this just relates the unsaturated zone travel time, saturated zone travel time, and the uh, sampling time and the time of recharge. And on the bottom here we have an equation, it's just a very simple equation or the unsaturated zone travel time. So the important part is that it includes all of this. It includes unsaturated zone travel time, saturated zone travel time, and reactions. And so when it comes to making use of your data, this is all calibrated. Um, 
and the, sort of the essence of this approach is to use a small number of parameters. Well, in the initial uh, incarnation of this model, we used a very small number of parameters. So we're essentially calibrating an unsaturated zone effective porosity, which determines the velocity in the unsaturated zone, uh, calibrating the recharge, the leaching fraction, and a reaction rate. And the rest of the parameters we either measure or populate from known quantities. Uh, and you can calibrate the input function if you have enough data. This is a great slide, huh? <laughs> there it goes. Um, so, uh, so initially, in the first version of this model, we applied it at in data intensive sites where we have closely spaced samples somewhere between one and 100 meters laterally and vertically, where we have clusters of wells and where we have relatively rich data for each well. For example, we might have nitrate oxygen, uh, excess nitrogen gas from denitrification and a suite of age tracers for every single sample. So this allows us to really determine our parameters with some confidence. So there used to be a map of the United States in the background there. I don't know, I, you can't see it there, but uh, these are the 14 sites that we worked at initially with the first version of the uh, vertical flux model. And this is this was published in 2012. This actually came out of the last uh, in, uh, agricultural groundwater conference. Um, and so for these 14 sites uh, here coming up, oh yeah. Here are uh, modeled and measured concentration profiles from the Maryland site. So just as an example, we have uh, vertical profiles of nitrate. This is the unreacted nitrate, which is the actual measured nitrate concentration plus the excess nitrogen from denitrification. Uh, chloride we included in this study, which doesn't give a whole lot of information at this site. Uh, oxygen decays and then denitrification begins, and this is the actual nitrate measured in the aquifer. Uh, excess nitrogen from denitrification and uh, age tracer, CFC 12. So we're able to get a pretty good match between the data and the model at these intensive sites. So the next challenge and the, sort of the reason for this presentation is to then take this sort of simple method and apply it to regional data sets. And here the issues change. The data is much more widely spaced. There's typically are often less data per sample. So in this case, we have uh, 250 wells. This is in uh, Wisconsin. You can see this red box here is a numerical model. Uh, we have 250 wells, about 500 samples, about 1,500 measurements of various tracers. So as a first cut, we just looked at how we would do using that previous version of the vertical flux model, just assuming uniform parameters. And you can see right away, of course, as you'd expect, that you get some large errors. Uh, but it's interesting to look at how those errors are distributed among the wells. Uh, these are modeled versus observed nitrate concentrations. Uh, this is a plus 10 error in the model, minus 10 error in the model uh, in milligrams per liter. And you can see that a lot of our errors are in this zone. Um, and the points are color-coded by depth. So the blue points are shallow wells. So where we tend to see errors are in these shallow wells that have low observed nitrate and high modeled nitrate. So this gives us some hint as to what's going wrong in the model with this uh, very simple, whoops, uniform version. So possible causes include uh, local denitrification, lower nitrogen input in some areas because of land use, for example, forested areas. This area is sort of a patchwork of land uses, uh, as well as heterogeneous recharge. So these all have to do with spatial heterogeneity, which is where we go with the next version of the model. So what we move to is a highly parameterized regional vertical flux model where we, um, for one thing, we added dispersion and travel time distributions in the samples in a more formal approach than in the previous version. Uh, and we relaxed the assumption of uniform parameters. So we move from a case where we have the same parameter everywhere to a case where we have individual parameters for every well. And of course, this becomes a lot of parameters very fast, five parameters per sample with 1,500 samples. Uh, so it becomes intractable in terms of calibration. 
And so we need to incorporate some other methods to be able to actually calibrate the model. Uh, and what we've done is to use regularization of parameters to avoid overfitting and to allow the model to converge. Uh, and just very briefly, uh, this is the case that you looked at before, and this is actually equivalent to a case where you have very strong regularization, where regularization just means that you're reducing the variance among your parameters for all of the samples. So if we have five samples here, if it's very heavily regularized, you have the same value of the parameter at every well. Uh, at the opposite extreme, if you did it with no regularization and you managed to calibrate it and it converges, you'll get an excellent fit your data will match your model exactly, but your predictions will probably not be very good because you're fitting the noise in the data. So what we're shooting for is something in the middle. So these are our preliminary results for predicted versus observed solute concentrations. Uh, on the top are CFCs. Um, in the middle, we have nitrate, oxygen, and uh, excess N2 from denitrification tritium, tritiogenic, helium, and carbon-14. And you can see in general we're getting fairly close matches between the model uh, and the data. Um, so it, it's nice in a way, but it raises the concern about overfitting. So we need to do some work to see if what we're estimating in terms of parameters at least makes sense. <clears throat> So this is a comparison of the shape of the calibrated nitrogen input function in this regional model. In this case, we actually calibrated the input function since we had so much data. Um, and the red curve here is the calibrated input function. The blue curve is the uh, estimates of fertilizer nitrogen application. These aren't exactly the same thing. You know, one includes all nitrogen going into the system. One is just fertilizer, but they look similar, which is a good sign. So we also looked at our estimated recharge values and compared those with some other estimates from uh, other studies in the area at the same locations as our wells. And what we found is that looking at the means in the 5th to 95th percentile range, the values that we're getting in this study are in the ballpark of three previous estimates, uh, including one based on base flow here, uh, one based on the soil water balance model, and one based on PRISM. Um, and these are either in press or in preparation. This one has been out for a while, but it's another good sign that our parameters make sense. So for the remaining parameters, we don't really have measured equivalents in the field that we can compare directly with. So um, what we did was to look at GIS variables in the vicinity of the wells and to do essentially a correlation matrix of all of our parameters with all of our GIS variables and to pick out the ones that had the strongest correlations and to see if they make sense. So I didn't include all of the parameters here, but for example, for the leaching fraction of nitrate, it correlates positively. Red and yellow are positive correlations, uh, green or negative correlations. It correlates positively with cultivated crops and highly drained soils. Um, I was happy to see this because this is an obvious expectation that you would have cultivated crops in areas where you have higher, uh, relatively high nitrate concentrations given the same input function. Uh, and we've also seen in previous studies in this paper from 2012 and other studies that are out there that you tend to have higher leaching fractions in highly drained soils. Um, and similarly in woody wetlands, natural areas with high organic matter Oops, we tend to have uh, lower leaching fractions. So for unsaturated zone effective porosity, this is a parameter that, it, that essentially estimates the velocity in the unsaturated zone. This tended to be positively correlated with deciduous forests and the sum, another measure of the uh, area of forests in the well source area. Uh, and this is also something that's been observed in previous studies. Perkins et al. in 2012 in GRL looked at soils in uh, Hawaii and found that developed forest soils tended to have more preferential flow and higher unsaturated zone velocities. So another good sign. Um, and in terms of the reactive parameters, the zero order O2 reaction rate and the zero order denitrification rate, these were the only ones that came up with correlations with other chemical parameters. Um, so it gives us some sense that these parameters at least 
are consistent with expectations of what we would see. So to summarize, uh, the simple vertical flux model can give a close match with regional observations when applied with spatially varying parameters, not so much when using uniform parameters, at least in Wisconsin. Wisconsin has pretty heterogeneous land use as compared to the Central Valley, I would say. Um, and when we look at the parameters that we're getting out of the model, they appear credible based on comparisons with known characteristics such as GIS variables and uh, known input functions of nitrogen. Uh, and the next step for this work is uh, continuous mapping of this regional flux model across the entire area using these correlations uh, between GIS parameters and uh, VFM vertical flux model parameters. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> any questions out there? Hi. My question is about the predictive and saturated zone porosity. It seems that it correlates with land that is undisturbed, like a forest land, but perhaps doesn't correlate very well with land, like agricultural land. Is that correct to assume? Uh, in the analysis that we did, agricultural land didn't come up as uh, one of the strong correlations. That's true. And that's consistent, as I mentioned, with, uh, you know, the positive correlation with forested land is consistent with research that's been done at other sites. In, in, in your um, model, you, you estimate uh, the travel time through the uh, vital zone. You're, you're using the uh, uh, effective philosophy. And I saw that somebody, uh, quite a few people are using field capacity instead mm -hmm. of effective philosophy. Can you tell me? why you're using a, a little bit different than what I saw in literature. Thank you. Well, this is an effective transport uh, porosity, so maybe I should have clarified that. But it is, it is essentially a fraction of pore space through which transport occurs. So you could, um, you could, we could check and see if that correlates. But since it's a calibrated parameter, um, we're not using any measured physical quantity to represent it. Anybody else? So, I, was, I was hoping you could clarify how you kind of deregularized the data. So it seemed like in the, the initial example you gave, everything was constant across and you could just, and then the, the new, in the Wisconsin model, the parameters would vary, but it wasn't clear to me how you decided to vary them. Was it based how on that's... the data that you had that's correlated with these? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, I didn't think anyone would be interested in the details of the calibration, but that's what it goes into. The, the way it's actually implemented is to add a small penalty in the calibration. You know, with this sort of approach, usually you're doing something like some of some squared errors, and you just add a term that might be something like the variance of uh, your data, uh, of your parameters, rather. So if your parameters are varying by a lot, you have a large penalty. And so as you're running the calibration, it tries to reduce that variance of your parameters. And so you can adjust it. You can make it either flat, where they're all the same, or you can let them vary by a lot. But even just adding a tiny regularization term uh, helps it to converge, because a lot of these samples are underdetermined, they have uh, maybe the same number of data and parameters. So by adding that regularization, it, it gives it, it's basically just saying if you don't know what the value is here, make it the same as the other values is what it comes down to. So then you have to do a little bit of work afterwards to make sure that your parameters, that you're not pulling out parameters that don't have meaning. Because some of them are just, they're just given the value that they have because that's what all the other values are coming out as. So it's, it's entirely in the calibration step. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Chris. Thank you.